So hi, uh, my name is Shrikant. I am a software engineer here in uh, Google. I work in the air travel infrastructure group. I work mostly on uh, Google Flight Search, and today I'll be talking about some of. Well, I'll be giving you an introduction about the airfare search problem, some of the issues associated with it, what are the technical challenges, give you some idea of what algorithmic challenges lie ahead, and a brief insight into how we solve them. Uh, with me is my colleague Adam, who's going to be answering any of the questions that I might not be able to answer. And so we're going to start with, uh, well, let me open up my presentation and we can start with that. And yes, for uh, anyone who is on live stream, they can, you can use the Q&A app to ask questions. For everybody who is on the Hangouts with me, you can use the group chat feature to ask questions. And let's see, let's get started. All right. So yeah, this is uh, my slide deck. All right, so the airfare search problem. For the most part, this is the call flow that we're all familiar with, right? Uh, that, I'm sorry, let me start with an outline, what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about the airfare search problem itself, where I'm gonna show you how huge the problem space is. But the problem space being huge by itself is not always a problem. If uh, an issue, you can always solve it if you have smart enough, efficient enough algorithms. But the complexity here is that airline pricing by itself does not yield to efficient solutions. And combine these two things, the large, huge problem space and the complication associated with airline pricing, you end up getting a very, very complex airfare search problem which, which is provably complex. That is, you will see that many of the, even the simplest problems are actually NP hard in time complexity and EXP hard in space complexity. Uh, I'll get to it later. So here at Google, we have an algorithm called QPX that tries to make sense of this complexity and actually give you efficient answers to your queries. And that'll be the next part of the talk. And I will finish up with, uh, well, some outline of problems and challenges that we face right now or we expect to face depending on how the regulations in the airline industry changes. But there are regulation changes in place which might make life a little bit more difficult than it already is for us. But you know, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. So let's start with the airfare search itself. Uh, this is the call flow that we're all familiar with. Say, for example, you want to go from San Francisco to Boston. I picked that because I live in Boston. The headquarters is near San Francisco. I want to go from San Francisco to Boston, a round trip. So I go to one of many places, say an airline agent, a travel agent, you know, something like Expedia or Google Flight Search or the airline website itself, all of which essentially is backed up by a search engine. And in that search engine, I enter my query saying, I want to go from San Francisco to Boston on April 2nd, return on April 5th. And this search engine then goes ahead, computes a result, and sends it back to me saying, well, you can take AA123 on the way from San Francisco to Boston and AA191 from Boston to on your way back to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, and then AA15 from Dallas-Fort Worth to San Francisco, all for 634. But for the most part, what's happening is that these search engines are not operated by the airlines themselves. They are not operated by the travel agents themselves. These are third-party entities. There are multiple such search engines. Google has one of these. And what it does is that it, it gives you a set of answers, uh, or which is essentially a specific set of flights, you know, one for each part of the trip and a price associated with it. And the rest of this talk, I will, will focus mostly on the difficulties that these search engines face. Why is it that they face these difficulties? And I will show you how it's inherent to the problem itself. Now, the search engine itself, you can think of it as uh, something running on a database of flights, prices, and seat availability. And this data is given to these search engines by the airlines through a private network. Uh, and you have about 800 or so airlines. And more often than not, each of these airlines' feeds, data feeds, have to be negotiated individually. I mean, these, these feeds are not available to the public. And this data is updated daily or you know, even more frequently if you have things like unexpected cancellations of flights. 
The prices themselves are updated about 10 times a day, and the availability is updated continuously. Uh, and a large portion of this, you know, which is that the flight price heat availability data is referred to as published data and is used by the company. So to give you an idea of like how, how this works, you can think of each flight search query as being consisting of one or more slices. And here a slice is a user specified origin, destination, and time. So for example, a round trip queries have two slices. So given this, it, uh, if you look at the search space itself, we're talking about around 4,000, 3,700 airports with commercial passenger service uh, all across the globe, which makes for about 7 million connected pairs. That is a pair of source and destination. You get 7 million connected pairs, which gives you about 380 billion possible round trips. And these search engines, for the most part, service about 2 billion passengers that travel each year worldwide, not to mention many other you know, people who actually search for airfare but don't actually fly it. Now, also, if you look at, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, the other thing that you have to look at is despite this, you know, a large number of airports are on 3,700 or 4,000, very, uh, very few of them have a very large connectivity and a, a very small, uh, a large number of them have a very small amount of connectivity. So this can, this leads to, a, this is because of the hub and spoke system that the airlines use, which leads to interesting sort of features in how the airfare search works out as you'll, as you'll see next. Let's go back to that initial problem, right? Going back, going from San Francisco to Boston. Now here, if we look at, it, the quickest 1500 paths, this is sort of what it looks like. You've got uh, all of this are within one day. There, you have about 20 or so direct flights, but most of the flights are one hop. And as you can see, none of these flights are really, out, uh, journeys are outside the realm of possibility. And this is about 1500 quickest paths you can find. And it turns out that this is really not you know, all of it. In fact, if you expand the search a little bit further and say, well, maybe not the 1500 quickest, what are the, say for example, you say, I want to pay less and maybe there are other flights. Then you can look at about 10,000 different paths through which you can go from Boston to San Francisco. All of this is pretty much leaving Boston and arriving San Francisco at the same day. So in some sense, it's, if somebody is really wants to take these flights, they can and arrive on the same day. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. And even this doesn't begin to exhaust the set of possibilities to go from San Francisco to Boston. In fact, there are nearly 30,000 flight combinations. You know, like, and in fact, even more if you consider nearby airports. Like instead of going to San Francisco, you could go to San Jose. Instead of going to Boston, you could go to Providence, Rhode Island, and so on. And most of these paths are of length two to three stops, hops. And for a traveler who's willing to arrive the next day and not just the same day, the number of possibilities pretty much squares. That's 30,000 square. And if you consider, and this is just two airports that are relatively close to each other on the map, right, on the globe. Now, if you consider international airport pairs where the shortest route may be about five flights or six flights, which happens if you're flying from a small airport in the U.S. to a, another small airport in India, you could potentially be taking five or six flights to get from one place to the other. You're talking about 10 raised to 15 options. No. Uh, 10 raised to 15 number of ways in which you can go from one place to another. And that's, that's just tip of the iceberg in some ways. So this is what I'm talking about when I say that the problem space is huge. You know, when weighted for uh, sort of the number of departures across the largest airports, you're talking about on average, an airport has 22 airlines servicing about 64 destinations. And the shortest path average is about 3.5 uh, hops within US and about five worldwide. And the diameter can be pretty large. It could be as large as 10, for example, from a small airport in Greenland to a small airport somewhere in uh, Vanuatu, which is uh, some in the Pacific, just off of Australia you cannot take fewer than 10 flights to get from one place to the other. Now, that is 
a really dense and a really sparse graph at the same time, depending on which part of the graph you're looking at. And we're talking about 30 million scheduled commercial flights a year, which is about one flight per second. And at, at any given time, you have about 4,000 to 10,000 planes in the air that are mostly large jets. And at any given time, you have about 700,000 people that are flying. So this should hopefully convince you that the problem space that we're looking at is huge. There is no simple way of saying, hey, I'll just run a simple algorithm and I will come up with answers quickly. No, the, the data set is simply too large to be able to do that. Okay, well, the other option is to say, all right, we've got, we've got huge data centers. Google has them. Amazon has, uh, Google and Amazon have made it available to anybody who chooses to use them. So why not just use all of that computing to parallelize it, make it faster, and just give us good results? Turns out the next piece of the puzzle that makes it very, very difficult is airline pricing. Pricing an airline ticket is extremely complicated. I'll tell you why. Consider the simplest case, right? You have a one-way flight going from San Francisco to Boston. You've even picked what flight you want to pick. That's UA226 on United. And you've picked the date. You want to fly on 20th of July. Now, if you go, go and ask, say, United or anyone saying, all right, these are my requirements. How much, what, what does it cost? It turns out that United publishes something like 65 one-way fares from San Francisco to Boston. And you know, what makes them different other than, of course, the price itself? It's about what kind of rules apply to each of these fares. For example, some fares may be valid only on weekends. Others may be valid only on weekdays. The fares may depend on seasonality. Some may be summer fares. Some may be winter fares. Maybe you know, the Traffic is higher in summer. More people want to fly in summer, so they have separate fares for that. Some fares are applicable only for advanced purchase. If you purchase only 30 days ahead of time, if you want to purchase it at the counter at the airport, some of these fares may not be available to you. There are blackout dates. You know, like, so there are so many other different combinations for which you have different fares that it's very difficult to answer the question, I want to fly from San Francisco to Boston on this flight on this day. What fare should I pay? So that in itself is not too bad, right? Going through about 65 or in something of that order of magnitude number of fares shouldn't be problematic. But also on the same fare that in this case is $203.72, there are other ways to fly from San Francisco to Boston. I could fly via Chicago. Now, when I fly via Chicago, I'm taking two flights. One is UA-489 and the other one is UA-998. And now I can split this $203 fare into two fares of $182 and $67 and change. So now if you look at all the number of ways in which I can go through a single hop, now you, you can quickly see how this sort of uh, grows exponentially. In fact, for this reason, to, to represent all of these uh, hops, each fare usually has what is called a route map associated with it. Think of it a directly a, a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. So in this case, you're going from San Francisco to Boston, and the you can see the DAG below on this slide. You can think of the directions of these uh, arrows, these edges, as being from top to bottom. And don't look at this DAG as the DAG by itself. Think of it as the transit of closure. That is, I have an edge from San Francisco to Denver. I have an edge from Denver to Washington. I have an edge from Washington to Boston. It implies that I also have an edge from San Francisco directly to Washington and Washington to Boston. So think of it more as a transitive closure, not as a DAG itself. But the point is, each of these arrows are associated with a flight that can get there and associated with a set of fares that you can use. Also, sometimes it turns out that a d direct flight is more expensive than flying through, say, Chicago, even though it probably cost the airline more to fly through Chicago. Well, why? Well, it's because sometimes cheap fares that you get don't actually pay for the flights. The airline, in some sense, is spending more to take you there than what you're paying for it. And the reason it does it is because competition can make things look really weird in terms of pricing. And I'll get to why and how this works out as we go later in the slide. But uh, j just to say that 
the set of fair combinations that you can use will start growing exponentially with the number of hops that you're willing to take. Now, this is just one way, but it turns out about 80% of the flights that people take or tickets that people buy are round trip. So round trip fares have both onward and return journey and airlines often offer discounted round trip fares. Say for example, United publishes about 18 round trip fares to San Francisco to Boston. And these round trip fares have rules about which, which fares you can apply and which fares you cannot. Now, for example, you can have say minimum stay. You're allowed to stay. If, you're, if you stay for 14 days or more, you get a cheaper fare. If you stay for seven days or less, you get a more expensive fare. And the reason is that airlines are constantly trying to differentiate their customers. For example, business clients, travelers, do not want to stay over the weekend. And business uh, travelers are also less price sensitive. On the other hand, leisure travelers are more price sensitive and tend to use up their weekends as a way to extend their stay. So you can have different pricing for air tickets that don't span a weekend versus the tickets that do span a weekend. So that's just two ways in which people travel, right? You've got one way and you've got round trip. In fact, it turns out there are several different ways in which you can have trips that are very complicated. Well, you've already seen one way and round trip. And now you have something called a destination open job where you go from A to B, but return back to A from a different airport from C. Or you have an origin open job where you go from A to B, but return from B to C. You could have a double, double open job. And mind you, or, or a circle, mind you, these are really distinct trip geometries. You can price a ticket as one way from A to B and one way from C to D. Or you, could, you might actually be able to price a ticket as a single open, double open jaw ticket from A to B, C to D, and different rules would apply. And both these are completely valid ways of pricing a ticket. So yes, you know, if you look at a circle trip below in this, you know, it goes from A to B to C, you can also price it as an origin <coughs> open jaw that goes from A to B and B to C, and a separate one way that goes from C to A. I mean, like, as you can see, the number of ways in which you can take a complicated trip and split it up into different uh, you know, uh, trip geometries that describe the trip, again, grows exponentially. This should give you uh, another idea of how the problem space is growing, mostly because of how pricing works. So moving next, here's another thing that you could do, moving on. Say so you've got a round trip ticket, right, from San Francisco to Boston. It could, you can actually think of it as two round trip tickets, one from San Francisco to Chicago, and another round trip ticket from Chicago to Boston. And you might be able to price them differently to say, I'm going to now combine these two round trip tickets to create a complete round trip ticket from San Francisco to Boston. And this could be cheaper. Why? For example, by splitting it this way, you might be able to get a weekend stay. You know, for example, if you're saying, okay, I'm going to San Francisco to Chicago on Friday and going the same Friday to Boston and returning uh, Monday from Boston to Chicago and then Monday from Chicago to San Francisco, the San Francisco to Chicago has this weekend stay built into it, which might make that ticket cheaper than flying from San Francisco to Boston all the way because, you know, for whatever reason, the fare rules make it more expensive. So now what you're allowed to do is airlines allow you to say, all right, so you can combine these two round trip tickets into a single round trip ticket. So this is where we introduce the notion of a priceable unit. Here, this ticket consists of two priceable units. It could also consist of four priceable units. One is a one way from San Francisco to Chicago, another one way from Chicago to Boston, another one way from Boston to Chicago, another one way from Chicago to San Francisco. And so you can think of a priceable unit as the smallest unit for which the airline is willing to sell you a seat. That's, that's sort of the simplest way to think about it. So let's take a concrete example. A real San Francisco to Boston round trip you know, with, with four specific United flights. Right? So San Francisco to Chicago, Chicago to Boston, Boston to Denver, returning from Denver to San Francisco. This, it turns out, has about 
24 priceable human geometries and 23 unit partitions. That is, there are 24 different geometries that you can extract out of this. And naturally, this entire journey has to be partitioned into different priceable units. And there are about 23 such possible partitions, which give, and in fact, it gives you over 153,000 ways to price this ticket. Now, of course, 24 times 23 will not give you 153,000. So where did that extra complication come from? Well, let's find out. Now, to, to figure out where this complication comes from, we have to understand another term that the airline uses called a fare. A fare is price for a one-way travel between <coughs> two cities. A fare is just a number, right, in some sense. It's the price. It is different from a priceable unit. A priceable unit is actually a ticket that an airline is willing to sell you, the smallest unit. A fare is just a price. For example, you could say, I'm going from San Francisco to Boston for a fare of $200. That's a fare. But this fare also, it has an identifier, and the fare also have rules that are restricting its use. So here are three rules that they have to satisfy. First is that each flight must be covered and paid for by exactly one fare. Why? Well, consider the example going from San Francisco to Boston and back. Suppose I could find a cheap fare that takes me from San Francisco to Boston via Chicago, and another cheap fare that can take me from Chicago back to San Francisco via Boston. I should not be able to combine the two because the Chicago to Boston leg is overlapping. So it, it's those cases that the first axiom uh, make sure that you don't have, that each flight must be covered and paid for by exactly one fare. And a fare may cover one or more usually consecutive flights. That is, you cannot have a fare that covers zero flights. And then one or more fares are used to pay for a complete journey. That is, you cannot have fares that don't cover a complete journey and yet somehow be able to price it or uh, for airline be able to give you a ticket on it. So combine the flights it covers with the fare that you're paying for it, you get what is called a fare component. Now, given a fare component, you're now looking at combinability. You have to combine multiple priceful units to create a ticket, multiple fares to create a ticket. So how do you combine them? Now, there are rules. You cannot just combine any two fares that you think will pay for a flight and then buy it. The f so these com combination rules could be things like, for example, some fares can be combined into a round trip, other fares cannot. Now, which of these fares can be combined into a round trip? Some fares will allow you to buy a ticket on one leg of the journey on one airline and other leg of the journey on another airline and some of the other fares don't. So the thing is, rules like this, what they do is you cannot just compute the price of a particular flight in isolation. You cannot say, I'm flying from San Francisco to Boston. What is the cost of the Chicago to San Francisco leg? It cannot answer that question unless it knows everything about your itinerary because the fare rules will restrict what kind of fares can be used to price that leg of the flight. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, the airlines also have another variable called availability. Not, not the physical availability of a seat, but what they call the financial availability of a seat. It is, it is not uncommon, in fact it is more often than not expected, that the person you're sitting next to you in an airline uh, during a flight has paid a different amount for the same ticket, for the same experience, for the entire same process than you have. And this is why. It's because seats are divided into buckets that are identified by a booking code. In fact, if you look at your airline ticket, you will see a booking code. It says like for economy, typically it's Y, for first class it's F, so you can have like A, Q, Y, and so on. And each bucket is associated with a price point. And airlines are constantly adjusting prices by opening and closing these buckets. And these opening or closing is based on the number of seats booked or canceled, sometimes just time passing. For example, some buckets may be open only up to uh, 30 days before the, flight, uh, before the flight takes off, and others may be open only past 30 days. And usually they also use some sophisticated sort of demand models, and it's called, it's called revenue management, at least that's the term that the airlines use for it. So now, for example, Using this seat availability, every time you want to buy a ticket, you have to ask this question. 
is the seat available? And the airline's answer is, eh, it depends on how much you're willing to pay for it. So for example, you want to ask the question here, I'm flying from San Francisco to JFK in New York on flight A A191 on January the 24th. How many seats are available? And then you say, all right, so what is your booking code? You say, well, you know, I want it on booking code H because, you know, I'm willing to pay no more, uh, about $436 for it, which is my ticket with the booking code H. And then the airline looks up into its availability database and all you see are these numbers like this, which don't make much sense in the first go. But what it essentially says is that here on first class, you've got one seat available from San Francisco to JFK and one seat available from JFK to Boston. On the Y booking code, you've got four seats from San Francisco to JFK and four seats from JFK to Boston and so on. And the H booking code, you see San Francisco has four seats available, uh, San Francisco to JFK, JFK to Boston has three seats available. So combine those two, the answer is you've got three seats available, the min of these two. Now, if you notice the Q booking code, which is right next to H, it has one seat available in JFK from JFK to Boston, but nothing available from, Boston, uh, from San Francisco to JFK. Now, which means that even though you've got a Q1 seat available in booking code Q, it cannot be combined with the San Francisco to JFK flight because the Q code doesn't have anything available on the first flight. And this is what makes it complicated. So airline seat availability is a lot more complicated than just like, oh, how many reserved seats do they have? How many have you sold and how many are available? This is a way for airlines to dynamically adjust the pricing of a ticket. So th th this is what makes it complicated. This is what makes it very dynamic. And this is what makes it difficult to answer the question, hey, is there a seat available? almost always the airline will say, yes, there is available depending on how much you're willing to pay for it. So this is how the availability dynamics works. For example, you, you know, in this graph, think in the x-axis is from, goes from the left to the right, uh, goes down from left to the right, the days up until departure. So at the rightmost column, you've got the flight taking off. And the leftmost uh, column, you've got 60 days before the flight. And each of these F, Y, H, Q, and G are booking codes. And say they're first class or business, uh, codes that's economy class. So as you can see, the first class is available for $2,000 up until about 20 days. Now, a lot of it is available. And then they start restricting the number of first class tickets available, well, presumably because people are buying them up. On the other hand, if you look at the Q class below, a lot of it is available until about 35 days before the flight. And then somewhere around 30 days before the flight, it just drops down to zero and say, we're not willing to sell you a $100 ticket on Q class. But at the same time, we are willing to sell you an H booking class ticket for economy class, a H booking code ticket for 400 or the Y booking code ticket for 800 And then say 25 days before something happens, say there's a rash of cancellations and the airline opens up the Q class again. Say, so oh yeah, now a hundred dollar ticket is available again. And then those get sold out and it closes it again and so on. And maybe the G class ticket is never available, which is just for ten dollars, which is not uncommon. So this is sort of how the airlines respond to the pressure, to the competition, to how they see the seats filling up and how much revenue they think they can generate in filling up this uh, filling up this plane. So it's uh, yeah, like and you, you would think that this would make it complicated enough, and in fact, not yet. Because there are still more things that the airlines do that make airline pricing complicated. And this is called origin and destination availability. Now you've got all these pricing buckets, you've got all these availability data, you've got all of this figured out, and at the end of it, what it turns out that every ticket that you can price, every seat, the physical seat that you're talking about where somebody sits, or virtual seat that is occupied by somebody buying this ticket, is a potentially a part of many, many products. For example, think of this graph here where you have a flight from San Francisco to Denver, and a seat there as part of two products. One is a flight, a journey from San Francisco to Boston. Another one is a journey from San Francisco to Miami. So if you were to fill up the San Francisco to Denver flight 
with everybody going to Miami, then you will no longer be able to sell tickets, for this, as many tickets for San Francisco to Boston flight. So in some sense, these two flights are competing with each other on that Denver ticket. So which means that in order to be able to price the San Francisco to Denver ticket so that the airlines can fill it in properly and make sure that they can fill the Denver to Boston flight as well with sufficient number of people, the airlines want to know what the entire itinerary is. So they're not going to just tell you, oh, right, so you've got San Francisco to Boston ticket and then uh, uh, I'll give you the San Francisco to Denver uh, slice for this much amount of money. Like, no, no, no. You've got to tell me what your origin is, ultimate origin is, ultimate destination is. Is it round trip? Is it what? Because this San Francisco to Denver leg is is in competition with so many different other origins uh, and destinations that we have to first figure out where we can make the most amount of revenue, where we can optimize the sale of this ticket to maximize our revenue. And it turns out even for the airlines, it, it's a very, very difficult optimization problem. And in fact, you know, there's a research in network revenue management, which is a very popular topic in operations research. And airlines employ a lot of economists and a lot of mathematicians to come up with more and more complicated models to solve this problem. The interesting thing here is that sometimes you cannot take the, the O&D availability of one origin and destination are sort of uh, dependent on each other. You know, like, so the taking the flight from San Francisco to Denver for $200 might depend on you taking the Denver to Boston flight. And you taking the Denver to Boston flight for $400 might depend on you taking the San Francisco to Denver flight. So in that case, you say that you know these flights are said to be married. So this is sort of the interdependence that you have, which makes which leads to so uh, a lot of complications when you're trying to actually do a search and figure out which price is better and which is not. But, I mean, all of this sort of leads back to a question, right? I mean, why do we have this mess? Why do you have this variable pricing? Why are the airlines doing this? Do they just enjoy making our life difficult? Well, it turns out that the claim that the airlines make, or the economists working for airlines make, is that there is no price such that the such that the price times the demand for that price is more than the cost of flying a plane you know what does that mean so this is what they're saying so for example if i were to fill a jet with all hundred dollar tickets then it would be easy of course i'd fill it up with a hundred dollar tickets and say the capacity is 150 people so I make about $150,000 filling that in. But that's not enough to pay for the cost of flying the airplane. Because the cost of flying the airplane is something much higher. <coughs> All right. So for the cost of flying the airplane, maybe I have to price it at about $700. Okay. So if I price it at $700, I will not be able to fill the plane. So now the question is, how do I do these two things? How do I both fill the plane and cover the cost of flying the plane? Well, I say, well, the way we do it is that you, you get a lot of people to pay a small amount of money so that they can fill up the plane to an extent and then charge a few people a lot of money to fill up more seats so that in total you, you would have filled up the plane and you would have covered your cost. Now, you can argue about whether or not this claim is true or false, but for now, let's take airlines at their face value and say, all right, no, this is, uh, this is fine. This is true. So what does this mean? It means that airlines end up offering a portfolio of fares at different prices. So they prevent the rich or, you know, let price the travelers who are not price sensitive, for example, business travelers, from using up the cheap fares, you know, by requiring advanced purchases, prohibiting one-way priceable units, requiring Saturday night stays, and so on. And then for the rest of them, they can dynamically enable or disable fares according to demand. So think of it this way, right? If you have business travelers who pay, who are, who are not price sensitive, who pay a lot of money, and that sort of covers a large portion of an airline's cost to fly this. Now, the rest of these seats, if they're not sold at a discount, they're not going to get sold at all 
which means that the airline loses all revenue that it could get from that seat. So it makes more sense for the airlines to actually sell those seats for cheap, just fill up the plane and fly and make more uh, and increase their revenue that way. So now that I've told you about the dynamic seat availability, about origin and destination availability, about variable pricing, about revenue management, let's go back to our concrete example. That real San Francisco to Boston trip, this is how you get 153,000 odd ways to price. It's because each way, for example, from San Francisco to Chicago, you've got 89 fares, of which for this particular journey, maybe about 13 are usable. From Chicago to Boston, you've got about 84 fares, of which about 20 are usable. The direct flight from San Francisco to Boston, not direct flight, sorry, the direct ticket, which goes through Chicago, has about 74 fares, of which 15 are usable, and so on. You put all these things together, just the combinatorics add up to about 153,444 distinct ways to price. And that is just one ticket, one round trip journey across from two airports off the 4,000 in the world on a single day of the many possible days that you could be flying. And, and that is, that should give you an idea of why is it that you know, the, the problem is so difficult? It's not just the, the scale. It's not just the number of people who are flying. It's not just the number of airports. It's not the size of it. It is that even pricing each individual ticket can be so expensive and complicated. So what's one way to do it? Well, here's an algorithm for a particular combination of flights. Choose a set of available booking codes. Choose a set of fares that cover the flights. Partition those fares into priceable units. Optionally, partition you know the priceable units into tickets as well. Impose all the external criteria like you know whether you want you're flying first class or business class or economy, and then go verify if all the fare rules pass, and then check if the total price, uh, and then optimize for the total price. You know, obviously, this is not a practical algorithm. You would never be done if you started doing this. So. What would be a practical algorithm? As it turns out, it's very difficult to answer that question. And one of the reasons is because, computationally speaking, this problem is hard. So before I talk about what the computational complexity of these problems are, let me actually define the airfare search problem more concretely for you. Now, I define the airfare search problem as, as follows. For a search query, which says, you know, origin, destination, dates, Find the quote uh, unquote best solution where best is defined in you know a certain way, which satisfies the following criteria. You know, a set of flights that satisfies the travel query, a set of fares that covers all these flights exactly once, a partitioning of the fares into priceable units. And for each fare, the solution that you provide must satisfy the fares rules which could restrict the flights in the fare component, the flights and fares in other fare components of priceable units, mind you, <clears throat> because of O&D availability. You cannot just have fare rules within a particular fare component. You also have to look at the fare rules as applied to other fare components within that priceable unit. And then the priceable unit geometry itself, whether or not, whether or not this fare can be applied for a given, price, for a given geometry, uh, trip geometry, and then all the flights and fares and the priceful units within the journey. I mean, this is less common, but it does happen that sometimes it says, all right, give me the entire journey. The flight rules requires the entire journey to, to be able to decide whether or not it can apply. Now, one important consequence of all of these restrictions is that, you know, there's no way to enumerate all the one-way, you know, flight combinations for many queries and the approximately, you know, squared number of round-trip flight combinations. It makes it impossible to consider all of these things. And, and at the end of it, you should be able to give the answer to this question in a matter of seconds. And so the air travel prices and paths have this really complicated relationship with each other. Which, and this is what makes you know, air travel planning very different from any of the other you know, route planning problems. You know, like Google Maps has this route search, right? We can give you a best route from point A to point B, but this is very different because of all of these complications associated with availability uh, and all the other uh, you know, priceable geometries and so on. 
And the other thing is that you can't even use a dynamic programming techniques, you know, like Dijkstra's algorithm or something, to reduce. You, know, you, can, you can potentially think of using dynamic programming to reduce the exponential number of paths into polynomial number of paths and then solve the problem. But here you can't do it because if you notice, if you know in dynamic programming, one of the things that you do is you say, all right, so to get, if I want to get from point A to point B, let's, let me find an intermediate point C, and then let me find the best solution to point C, and then find the best solution from C to A, B, and then use that to get the best solution from A to B. You know, that's sort of how dynamic programming works. But we can't use this because I cannot tell you what the price, I cannot tell you what the price is or what the state of the search for this price is by just knowing the current position. I cannot tell you if I'm in C, what is the best price. I will have to depend on how I got to C and where I'm going from C. And this makes, the, so now dynamic programming is out the window. You can't use that. So now the question is, what are you left with? How do you solve this problem? Well, to understand how to solve this problem, we have to first understand how hard this problem is. 